This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly. On today's show, Personal Security Part 1, it's a Raspberry Pi tour. It's a Twitch show where we build, bend, break, and upgrade. I am Father Robert Ballas here. And I'm Brian Burnett. And for the next however many minutes it takes, we're going to, you know, pour the knowledge stuff in. That's right. Head. Right into your, your cranium. The, the knowledge hole. Because that, that's where it belongs. It's where it belongs. And that's where it's going to stay. And it should stay because we're doing something a little special today. Now, we right. had originally, originally planned to do a personal security series of episodes. But something happened that kind of uh, yeah. accelerated the need for us to want to talk about this. Yeah, we, we, don't, we don't do politics here, but we'll, we will say that there's been a policy change so that now your ISP could legally sell your information without telling you and without oh. informing you, without telling you after the fact, or even without reimbursing you. Oh, well, that, that's okay, though, that's good, right? right? Because it's good for consumer choice. I like that. ISPs can just see everything that you do. Right? <laughs> Precisely. I mean, when you think about what your ISP can actually see from your surfing habits, and, and I mean, I'm not talking about the nefarious stuff. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't mean, oh, they're cracking your encrypted messages. I mean, they know your browsing history right. because all those requests go through them. Mm -hmm. They know when you're online and when you're not. And, and then think about all the stuff that they get from just having your records. So they know your age, they know how you pay, they know if you pay on time. They're now allowed to sell all of that to third parties without ever telling you. Now, now to be fair, some of the largest ISPs like Comcast and AT&T have said, oh, we would, we would never, we would never, no, which no, is strange because they were the ones who lobbied for the change. Yeah, but that, that's yeah. totally unrelated. Totally, totally unrelated. unrelated. Yeah, I know, right? Ned. In in any case, I think what we should take away from this is again, let's not get political. Let's just say no. this has been a long time coming, and if this is the event that pushes people to be a bit more paranoid about their personal security, then I consider this a win. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think the way I was explained, it was explained to me, like I was five years old, was mm -hmm. that the ISPs are now being treated like if they were a YouTube or a Facebook, like. Yeah, and that, that was the idea behind it. So the way that they justified this change in rules, they said, well, it's not fair because some businesses are bound by these security laws and these privacy policies, whereas Google and Facebook, they can sell your information to anyone, which is true. That's absolutely true. Right. Here's the difference. If I don't like Google's privacy policy, I don't use Google. Right. If I don't like Facebook's privacy policy, I don't use Facebook, which I don't <laughs> because I don't like their privacy policy. Mm -hmm. I have no other option but to use Comcast. There yes. is literally no other broadband provider, so it's not like I can say, <laughs> hey Comcast, I hate what you're doing with my data, see ya, see ya. unless I want to like be on dial-up. Right, right. Because well, they don't have a monopoly or anything, no. right? And they definitely don't talk to each other to price match and uh, <laughs> non-compete clauses and stuff. Yeah, like that. it's it's not as if ninety-five percent of the country has one major provider and not another because they've kind of agreed to say, hey, yeah, you know no what? Way. No, let's not compete in the same markets. That would That's be expensive. Crazy. That's cray cray. But yes, uh, if there is a silver lining, it's people are probably going to take their personal security a little bit more seriously. Exactly. And you know what? Even without that change in the law, this is a good. Thing. People should, yes. uh, even if even if you aren't going to do anything about it, you should at yeah. least know what kind of digital fingerprints you leave in the sand. Yeah, and that's what we're going to show you today. Very cool. I've been wanting to play around with VPNs and learn about this stuff anyway. Yeah. Now we are specifically playing around uh, playing around with the Raspberry Pi Tor. It's a Tor project. It's the mm -hmm. Onion Router. So the whole idea is that your traffic gets anonymized because once you get into the the Tor system, uh, your traffic gets encrypted and wrapped bounce from node to node to node to node until it gets to an exit node near where you want it to be. Right. And that way, theoretically, people shouldn't know it's you. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about, about exactly what that means. That's not necessarily the case if, mm -hmm. you don't, if you're not smart about the way you surf. But right. very simple to do this. The only parts you really need are this. Actually, Alex, if you go to the overhead. That little this guy? Is, this is a Raspberry Pi 3. So this is the latest version. This is the 3B. Reason why we're using this is, of course, there's it's a bit more powerful. It's a bit better it, packaged. It was a big jump from the 2 to the 3. Oh, yeah. But the biggest reason why we like this, and we're not using a 2 for this project instead, is because 
this has built-in wireless. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, to, to do a tour, you're gonna need two network interfaces because you need one network interface that interfaces with the connection to the internet and then one interface that, that interfaces with your devices. Oh, okay, okay, cool. So all the traffic is gonna go through here. Mm -hmm. This is actually gonna route it into the, uh, the Tor network. Right, uh, okay. And so this will do the encryption, this will do the encapsulating. All I should have to do is connect this to both my network and to my device and everything should be taken care of. All right, and fairly easy to set up, I'm assuming. <laughs> we'll find out. Sure. Is that what we're just about yeah. to do. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, <laughs> let's say that. Let's say let's that say it is. That. Okay. Uh, that, this is. It, it's going to seem complicated, but the instructions are very clear in our show notes. Step by step. Okay. And I've also left a little thing there that you can download into like a USB drive and plug into the Pi, and you can just copy and paste the commands rather oh. than having to do the commands that I'm typing in. Okay. Cool. Okay. So it should be nice and easy. Totally. All right. So here's what we got. I've already done the first step. And the first step is to create the image, your Raspbian image on mm -hmm. a micro SD card. In this partic particular case, I've got, I've got this little carrier that has, I've got three of them, just wow. because I know I mess them up all the time. Well, just in case. Just yeah. in case. But um, yeah, so get the latest distribution of Raspbian Pi. Mm -hmm. uh, is it's, it Jesse, I think, or something? Yeah, just go to uh, raspberrypi.org. Uh, you can also get the Win32 imager or the appropriate one for OS X, mm -hmm. which will allow you to just image it onto a, a card. Now, it's it's amazing how much easier it is to do this now than it used to be. Do you remember when <laughs> like we were playing around with the Raspberry Pi 1? Yes, I do. It was it was a rough time. Like It was definitely fun experimenting with the, the first Raspberry Pi, but they kind of touted it as, like, finally, yeah. you have a credit card-sized computer. It's like, it's like yeah, no. it's a credit, yeah. credit card-sized computer, but you're not going to be able to browse the internet or anything. Precisely, like yeah. <laughs> So much easier now, so much better now. The other things I'm going to need is I need a keyboard because mm -hmm. I'm going to have to type into this, and then some sort of mouse. I'm just using this little wireless mouse I had sitting in the back of my storage closet. Nice. Uh, we're also going to we're going to be outputting to our HDMI here so that uh, y'all can see it because uh, I've, I've been heard that you guys enjoy <laughs> being able to see what we're see doing. Things, yeah. Ah, God, they're so um, complicated. The audience. They're demanding. Oh, they really are. Right. I mean, but we're, we'll do it. We'll do it for them. Just for you. <laughs> uh, now. Because this was originally going to be in May, I had a huge, uh, awesome project that I was planning for this. Well, you're going to go all out with a 3D printed case It was going to be a 3D stuff? printed case. It was going to yeah. have a battery in it so that you can carry this with you. It was going to have a little <laughs> touch screen. Mm -hmm. And I'll talk about the interface later on so you could switch the interfaces. Right. Obviously, we've moved it up a little bit. We don't got time for that. We don't, no, ain't no one got time for that. So mm -hmm. we're going to do the super sexy one later on. Right. But I want to at least show you how this works. <laughs> this is the incredibly unsexy this is the unsexy. Raspberry Pi project. This is the, oh my goodness, how unsexy can you be? <laughs> We're about to find okay, out. We're about to find out. So I'm going to power <laughs> this thing up. And uh, in just a second, Alex, you should be able to switch over and you're going to show them the boot screen. This is, this is oh, well, as soon as it gets to its, uh, its regular thing. Okay, so now we're, we're in the Raspberry Pi. This is Raspbian. This the is the Pi. distribution that we're using. Oh, by the way, I've plugged in a little USB drive. This just has the, uh, the little text file that I created. This is going to be available for everyone. So if you go to our show notes, you can just copy this into a, uh, like a notepad file, into a text file. Put it on a USB drive and then have it available for your Raspi so that instead of having to type exactly what I'm typing on the screen, you, you can copy just, and paste. just copy and paste this over. Nice. Now, there are a couple of things that we want to do before, before we get to the process of actually installing the Tor, the Onion router. Yeah. The first thing is we're going to expand the volume. We're going to change the default username, which is going to require us to, to reboot after we do all this fun stuff. Yeah. Then we have to actually turn our Raspberry Pi into an access point. Okay. Yeah, so what we're going to do is we're going to be using the onboard Wi-Fi so that I can take any network signal that I'm getting over the Ethernet right. and I can share it with Wi-Fi devices that are in range. That is cool. So you're kind of just turning it into a little router then. Yeah, well, it's, it's yeah. Basic, well, I'm, I'm, I'm turning it into an access point and then I'm yeah. going to be adding the Onion router underneath it. Ah, yeah. yes, yes. Because remember, Very I need cool. to use at least, I need to use two interfaces to make this work mm -hmm. and Ethernet is going to be interface one and my Wi-Fi is going to be interface two. Okay, would this project work on the older Pies? Because they, um, I guess if you got a wireless adapter. You have to use a dongle. Yeah. Uh, and actually, some of those dongles are better than the onboard Wi-Fi on, on the three but it is so neat and clean because yeah, it's integrated it's compact. in the three. Maybe for our super project. Yeah. yeah we'll, well, we'll think about it. For the super project, for the it's, super sexy. it's going to get crazy. <laughs> okay, so let's go ahead and drop in. The first thing we need to do is we need to uh, go ahead and 
make the volume expand to the entire size of the card. This is a 64 gigabyte card, mm -hmm. and when I installed the image, I think it only used up two gigs. Right. Which, uh, me no like. I want to use the whole thing. I, I don't need it for this installation, but it might as well have it. So, sudo, and remember, sudo, it used to mean super user do. Not really. Now they're, uh, they're, they're yeah, it can be anything. Pseudo. Yeah. yeah. Pseudo. It, pseudo just means do it as another user, substitute right. user, okay? Substitute. I'm going to put raspi dash config, <clears throat> and it will get me to this. The first thing I want to do is expand my file system. So I'm going to hit enter. And this is pretty typical for any Raspberry Pi build that you do. Right. And, and uh, exactly. So now I've used up the entire card, which is what I want. Mm -hmm. As long as I've got the card, I might as well have the storage space available to me. Then I'm going to use two because the standard, the default password is Raspberry. It's not <laughs> so secure. No. If this is going to be a, sec a security device, I want to make sure that it's, you know, it's actually as secure as possible. Right. So I'm going to use my super secret password. <gasps> what is it? Know how. Whoa. You know. You've never used that password <laughs> no. before. No, I'm not going to do that. No. Uh, <laughs> monkey 2-3. There you go. There you go. Okay, so that's been changed, and we're gonna. And finish. let's overclock this. Let's no, not. Actually. Oh no, we don't need to overclock. This no. is working just fine. <laughs> yeah. I tried that once with the old Raspberry Pi. You know, when I was doing the emulator system. Doesn't like it. It didn't <clears> like <throat> it. No. It was very. It was a very minimal overclock, and I had to get little heat sinks to put on. Right, the Right, exactly. And, and you can actually still buy that. You can buy copper heat sinks, and it's sort of like you know what? <laughs> this is basically an embedded device. Yeah. I don't want to overclock it an embedded device. I want it to always work. That's it's like the whole idea. it's like putting flame stickers on a car or something. Go like, fast. It's gonna make it go, go faster. Go so fast. No, no. <laughs> keep it stable. Keep it easy. Keep it mm -hmm. at default settings. Okay. So now we're set up. It's rebooted. We've, we're using the entire volume, yeah. and I've got the, uh, the uh, default password, password has been changed. Cool. Okay. Now I need to go ahead and turn it into an access point. This is okay. where I'm going to need. All right, so I've got my text file here that's on the USB drive. Uh, this is going to allow me to, to copy over the, the uh, commands. Mm -hmm. I will actually explain the commands as we go. I'm going to open up a terminal window. Now, um, now, there was a long process kind of complicated to turn your Raspi into an access point. Yeah. Thanks to a guy by the name of Harry Allerston, uh, he Sounds created like a, a script on, on Git, uh -huh. which I can just invoke and it will do all the steps for me. Oh, cool. So thank you very much, Harry. Uh, if you go back to my terminal window, super simple here. All I have to do is git clone right here. So get this command, control C, paste it in here. Uh, I see. Yeah. So git clone HTTPS, it's going to have the address for the uh, the repository, github.com. Mm -hmm. This is this thing. It's All of this is is a script. So when I run this, the there we go. The so Pi is reaching out and fetching this. It's and reaching out and fetching. Oh, but by the way, uh, this should be self-explanatory, but you do need network connectivity for this to work. So <laughs> Right. Yeah. Plug it have into it the Ethernet. Yeah. The next thing I need to do is I need to, uh, if you go back to my terminal window, please, uh, cd rpi dash wireless. Uh, dash and hotspot. Capitalization matters. Capitalization does matter. And then I'm going to do sudo dot slash install. And there we go. Mm -hmm. And it's going to ask me if I want to make the changes. I'm going to say, yeah, go ahead and do it. Mm -hmm. It's going to update all the package lists. Then there's going to be a series of yes or no questions here. Uh, do I want to agree to the terms? Do I want to use the pre-configured DNS? Mm -hmm. Do I want to use the unblock US DNS servers? Do I want to use Wi-Fi defaults? I want yes to everything except to Wi-Fi defaults. I'm not going to be using the Wi-Fi defaults because that would be stupid. If I'm making a, again, I'm making a secure device, let's not right. use something that's really easy for people to guess. When it says Wi-Fi default, you mean like the password or something? Or? Right. So the the uh, the default password would be like one two three four five six seven eight nine, and the okay. default SSID is like Raspberry Pi AP. Wait, how did they get my password? <sighs> Brian, we've, <laughs> we've spoken about this. Don't. What is uh, unblock US DNS servers then? Right. So um, I'm I'm using the um, the. Their DNS servers mm -hmm. are configured so I can use them over Tor without exposing who I am. Ah, okay. I see. Um, what actually there there are a lot of security packages out there mm -hmm. that are good about encrypting your your traffic, except when it comes to DNS entries. They'll use DNS entries in the clear. The problem with that is anybody watching, yeah, yeah sure, the, all my traffic will be encrypted, but they'll still see as clear as day where I'm going because ah. they'll see it when I call for a DNS uh, um, uh, call. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, so you go back to my, there we go. So uh, yes, I'm going to use the pre-configured DNS. Yes, I'm using the unblock. Uh, and no, I am not using the defaults. <laughs> I'm going to use a, a new password, which is my super secret one. Corgi's Rock. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
And then uh, the new SSID, we're going to call it very creatively, oh, know how. Whew. Don't so, want to get it confused. Yeah, there we go. And uh, by the way, remember, when <laughs> there it are asks only you for, three real there channels. Are three real channels, folks. One, six, and eleven. If you choose any of the others, then you're a bad person, and you should feel bad. So, so I'm going to use gonna eleven. Pick two, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is you can check your chipset. If you are using a dongle, there's a very good chase, a chance that you're using the, uh, one of the Realtek chipsets. Okay. But if you're using the Raspberry Pi 3, it's Broadcom. So, no. No. Okay. Go. Do I require Chromecast support? No. And boom. It's going to reboot in 10 complete. seconds, so you, you're going to want to switch off the screen. What, we're gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, connect my phone to it really quickly, what? just so that we could show you that we're actually getting traffic through this. Oh, very cool. Right? Okay, hold on. Let me just do this. Hmm. Fantastic. So this is going to reboot. Now, you're going to see this happen a couple of times. We're going to have to reboot just because it's easier for me for the service to start up on the on reboot, reboot than me to start the service up manually. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, Which you can do. Yeah. You can do. And it's actually it's good to know how to do that. We will do that when we come, comes to the tour service. Yeah. But uh, also, when you reboot, it kind of it will rebuild any dependencies that got broken by what you just installed. <laughs> All right. So... This is back up. If I've done this properly, I'll be quiet. No, no. Aw. It wants to talk to you. No. Stop. It, you need help, clearly. <laughs> Google now. Thanks, Google Assistant. Anytime it does an update, it's like, oh, no, I know you said go away, but now you really want me back, right? <laughs> All right, so if you, oh, let me turn this down. There we go. So as you can see, Know how is now there, and I can join it. Nice. Have you uh, tested out the range at all with the the Raspberry Pi? Like, uh, it's one? not great. Yeah, it's I figure really you have not. to be probably super be pretty close. local. But that's good. No yeah, I, I don't want to be you know going crazy. Let's no, that's go good. To good Reuters. point. Yeah, you don't want it to be like pushing outside of your house or something. I guess. <laughs> okay. Now the phone is in airplane mode, so it's got no cellular connectivity. It's only got connectivity through the Wi-Fi. And uh, as you can see, what I can do is I can just go to like uh, Reuters. It's, yeah. This has had its cellular services turned off, so it's only going through the Wi-Fi. And there you go. So now nice. my Raspberry Pi is an access point. Awesome. Okay. Now, Brian, this gives us a unique opportunity. It does. Nobody it, knows you're on Reuters now. Well, also, because I know all of my traffic is going through this Raspberry Pi, mm -hmm. I can hook up a tap. We've talked about this before. I can hook up a tap, and I can see exactly what kind of information can be seen by my ISP. So my ISP owns the line. They own right. the wire. Let's simulate what the ISP can actually deduce from my traffic. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's smart. All right. I like so that idea. You may remember this. This was uh, the Shark Tap tap that we had uh, a while back. Mm -hmm. Actually, Alex, I think we have a link for this. It's, you know, it's a little pricey. It's about 180 bucks. Mm -hmm. But the nice thing about this is it's a super simple tap that will allow <coughs> me to go inline on any gigabit network and receive all the traffic that that network might be transmitting or receiving. Right. Okay. So here's how it's going to work. Okay. I've got this black line going into the Raspberry Pi right now. I'm mm -hmm. going to remove this like so. So this is the, this right here, this is the line that's going to the internet. Right. I'm going to plug this in on one side of the tap like so. And then the other side is going to go into the Raspberry Pi okay. like this. So if you were hooking this up in your home network or something, this the black one would be going to what, say like your your Synology router or something? Correct, right. And then to the Raspberry Pi, and then the orange one going to another this, computer so that you can now see the precisely. traffic? Precisely. So this orange cable that you see is actually going to this laptop that's on my desk right here. Uh, Alex, if you uh, switch over to HDMI 1. So this is running Wireshark. All this is going to allow me to do <laughs> is it's going to allow me to use the uh, network interface, the Ethernet interface, pl mm -hmm. plugged in via USB, which I believe is number four, and uh, I can see exactly what kind of traffic is passing. So this is only for my phone. My phone is the only thing that's connected to this thing right now. So for example, if I, if you come back to the overhead, let's, let's actually click on one of these stories. So we click on this one. All of the traffic right now is passing through the Raspberry Pi access point through wire uh, through the tap to my Wireshark. So, if I go over to the Wireshark, for example, I can type in DNS to filter as I'm scanning for just DNS entries. Anytime I search for a new page or click a new link, you see all those DNS uh, uh, entries. Yeah, that's the unencrypted clear text 
that my my ISP can see. And I'm only looking at one particular protocol. I'm only looking at DNS because uh -huh. it actually is quite important. Because if I click down on these individual entries, you can see exactly which website I'm going to. So that would point to, or it does say in the on the. Oh right, yeah, yeah. It just it? like this one. This is an Amazon link. Uh, there's a Wall Street Journal link here. If you read down down below, if actually go even further down, Alex. If you read down below, oh, even further down, further down. There you go. See down oh. below here. You actually, this is this is doing the uh, the hexadecimal translation, and it will actually show you which site you just requested. Wow. Okay, and it'll do that for all of the different entries, all of these different entries. Like this is going to double click. It shows you how many different things you're actually accessing anytime you access a page. So I may be accessing Reuters, right. but like this one's going off the Cloudflare. This one's going off to Amazon. This one's going off to Microsoft. Right. This these are all the different sites that now have a little bit of the page that I'm being served. Right. Okay? I don't want that. I mean, yeah, this this isn't bad. This is not horrific, but I, I don't want people to have that information. Right. This is par for the course when going on the internet. Precisely. All right. So here's what we're going to do. We, now that we have this access point on our Raspberry Pi, we're going to install Tor underneath it. Right. We know all the mechanics are working. I'm able to go from my phone to my Wi-Fi uh, access point on the Raspberry Pi mm -hmm. and the Raspberry Pi out into my my Ethernet network, which right. gets me onto the internet. So I know that works. All I need to do now is tell the Raspberry Pi how to take the traffic it's receiving, mm -hmm. put it into Tor, and send it out into the Tor network. Right, and then that's what will basically not allow ISP to know what you're, what you're uh, searching for, I guess? Kind of. So here's, here's how the Tor network works. Uh, I am still going through the ISP, mm -hmm. but it's an encrypted tunnel. And so it's the, bouncing off a bunch of it's other It's bouncing nodes off of other Tor. Tor so the very last node that if you could if you could find the exit node on the Tor network that I'm going out through, right. then you could do some damage. Then you can work backwards and and tr ha, not completely easily, but better figure out who's coming from where. Mm -hmm. But if you're just an ISP looking at the traffic, it looks like garbage. There's nothing. You can't even read my DNS entry. So at least you shouldn't be able to. We're going to get that in a just a little bit. So sure. let's go ahead and go back into my terminal window. Uh, we're going to do get fast and furious with our commands here, so I'm definitely going to need my little text file. Uh, so let's open up a terminal window. Now, the first thing we, we're going to want to do is we need to update our installation because uh, this is actually not the most recent distribution of Raspberry, Raspberry Pi. And also, I just added uh, a script that was created a while back. Mm -hmm. That's added a bunch of dependencies that I might need to fix. So this is really simple, sudo apt <laughs> get update. Apt get yeah. is just a, it's a command that allows me to check all the packages and all the dependencies that are currently inside of my Raspberry Pi uh, Raspbian inst installation. And if any of them are broken, it will fix them. And if anything needs updating, it's going to go out and get the most updated package and install it. Right. This right. is uh, this is Windows update except not as stupid. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to force you to another version in the of middle the of OS. an episode. Yeah, yeah, in the middle no. of the episode. And if you've ever done like a Raspberry Pi project, that's like one of the very first yeah. things that you ever do. And it's not like going to say, "Hey, I noticed you're in the middle of a show. Would you like me to upgrade you to a new OS that's going to take 10 hours to do?" <laughs> no. A Raspberry no. Pi won't do that. The okay. nice thing about being able to type it into the terminal too is it gives you the power. Yeah. yeah. I, not you not you know Microsoft me. bugging you about I'm, it. I'm all about the power. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm updated. If you go back to my terminal window, AppGet has done its thing. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to need to go ahead and uh, do a little something, something to install Tor. Super simple. sudo mm -hmm. apt get. Oh, actually, I should probably be in the right window here. Su uh, sudo apt get. This is super complicated, right? Install Tor. What? I know, right? Go figure. <laughs> so what it's going to do right now, it's, it's reaching out. It's going to install all of the uh, packages and dependencies that are needed for Tor. Would you like to continue? Yeah. This is, this is going to take a while. Now, as this is working, let's talk a little bit about what this is actually going to do, Brian. Okay. So when this receives a packet over the Wi-Fi interface. Mm -hmm. So from uh, your phone to... From my phone or a laptop. Any or whatever, computer yeah, that's using connected. the Raspberry Pi yeah. as an access point. It's going to take it and it's going to encapsulate it in the first layer of encryption. It's going to send it out into the Tor network, which, mm -hmm. and then it goes to another node, and it's going to add another layer of encryption. <laughs> and every node it hits, it's going to add another layer of encryption. This is why it's called the onion router. It's got layers. So even <laughs> like if you, an ogre. Like an ogre. Or a parfait. So even if you can 
see the layer in front of you and the layer behind you, you still probably don't know where it actually came from. That's yeah. the whole idea. The How does it know where it's going then? Well, because you know where it came from and you know yeah. where it's going, but you don't know two steps back and you don't know two steps forward. Oh, that's interesting. Right? That's that's how it's supposed to work. Wow. Okay. Okay. So uh, if you go back to my terminal window, this is all good. So this has, Tor has been con installed, but it is not configured yet. So here's what I have to do. I have to go sudo nano, and nano is just the text editor, mm. slash etc slash tor slash t-o-r-r-c. And it will get me into here. Now, uh, this is where I would definitely say, please just copy over from the text blob that I give you because mm -hmm. it's complicated to do it any other way. If you, if you go out a little bit, Alex, you're going to see this. I have this in the log file. It says, add the following to the config file. So just copy and paste this entire blob from log notice file all the way down to DNS list. All this is, is this, these are all of the, uh, the environmental variables that I want in there. Right, that you've customized for your network, it looks like? Precisely. Okay, and if you actually, if you go, ask, go back over to the, uh, the text window here, I'm just putting it between these two sections of comments. I'm mm -hmm. just going to paste it. And if you've ever followed any of our programming lessons, you'll notice that the, the hashtag hashtag, that like that's makes comment. it that's right. commented out. Yeah. yeah. So what, what I've done is I've added these lines right here. And this is just telling it, like, I'm going to be using port 9040. That's, that's how it's going to get out and into from the Tor router. I'm giving it my listen address at 192.168.42.1, and, one, and uh, I'm giving the DNS listen address at 192.168.42.1. Okay. So I'm going to save this with Control-X mm -hmm. and save the file. Enter. Good, back out here. Boom. Okay. This is not done because what's happening is Tor is set up, but the IP table... And IP tables is a function inside of Linux mm -hmm. that allows me to configure traffic rules, packet rules, what happens to a packet. It's, it's kind of like the firewall. Okay. That's still using the old set of rules, which was just a straight AP. Mm -hmm. I need to dump those rules, and then I'm going to put in new rules that forward all the traffic through the Tor service. Okay, that yeah, makes so, sense. Right. So if you go back to my, uh, <laughs> my terminal window, I'm going to put sudo IP tables IP. dash capital F. That just dumped one set. Now sudo IP tables dash oh, tab, blah, 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 <laughs> dash uh, t nat and dumping the nat rules. Mm -hmm. There we go. So I've dumped all the old rules. Huh. So now I can create new rules to to route the traffic through Tor. And again, I'm gonna uh, go back over to my handy dandy text file here, so you don't have to type the entire thing. The first thing I want to do is I want to route DNS. So all my DNS entries, rather than going in clear text, are now going to follow this. Paste it in, please. You'll notice it's a sudo IP tables dash T nat dash A pre routing dash I WLAN zero dash P UDP. So mm -hmm. we're, we're doing UDP packets here. Dash dash D port 53 dash J redirect dash dash two dash ports 53. Okay. Okay. So this is going to redirect all of my DNS routing through the Tor network. Oh, okay. Okay. The second one that I'm going to want to do is now that I've redirected uh, DNS, I need to redirect TCP, which is the the protocol that I'm going to be using most of the time. Okay. Control C. Okay. And this looks just like the other one. This is just a, a rule set that's going to route all my TCP traffic through port 9040. Right. Okay, so run that. Now, are you setting it to 9040, or is that like the default Tor? That's, def that's Tor. Okay. Yeah, it, it's got to be 9040. Okay. All right, now, uh, just to make sure I didn't mess anything up, let's go ahead and check my table. So I'm going to put sudo IP tables up, no, actually, UP tables, that's much better. Dash, uh, what is my command? Uh, dash T, NAT, dash capital, capital L. Okay, good. So I've got a redirect on UDP and I've got a redirect on TCP. So I'm good. Okay. My, my rules are great. If you hadn't done it right, what would you see? Would it just say... You, you actually, you, you might not even see the entries. Yeah, okay. Just make sure that those entries match what you typed in. So I'm, I'm routing UDP to, to port 53. Mm -hmm. I'm routing TCP to port 90, 9040. 90, okay, cool. Yeah. So I want to see that. If, it, if, that's the, uh, if that says that, then I'm good. Cool. Now we have to save that. We have to make sure that it actually saves that table because <laughs> if I if I were to reboot right now, it would just go away go and back I have to, to re-enter it. Default. Right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to save it by putting sudo. Actually, uh, it's going to be sudo sh dash c and then in quotations ip tables dash save mm -hmm. greater than slash etc slash ip tables dot ipv4 dot nat 
close quotation. I don't want to type all that, so I'm going to cheat and use my handy dandy little text file over here. <laughs> yeah, that's the one thing you notice about uh, typing things in the terminal is that you have to be super exact yeah. and precise, yeah. and sometimes with these long URLs and things, it gets It's really easy tedious. to mess it up, right? So just copy and paste it. We're, I mean, we're showing you just so you understand how this works. So I've now saved that IP table. Cool. What I want to do now is I want to create a log file. Earlier in the uh, config, I did tell it where I can find a log file. Mm -hmm. I could skip this, but I actually do want a log file. In case something doesn't work, I want to be able to go into that file and say, well, where did it break? Right. Uh, and in order for that to happen, I have to create the file. I have to change the ownership, and then I have to make sure that uh, the uh, the Tor has permissions to write to the file. Okay. Three lines. These are actually very important if you're planning to play with uh, Raspberry because they show off very important pieces of uh, the management. The, the first one is sudo. So again, super user or substitute user do touch. What touch does? Touch creates a new file. It just creates an empty file. So I'm going to create an empty file at slash var slash log slash Tor. It's notices. called notices.log. Okay. So it's just created that file. The second one is sudo chon. Chon See. is, it's a funny word that I just it like is. to say, chon. But uh, <laughs> what, what chon does, chon actually uh, sets um, uh, ownership. So I'm setting ownership for that file to the Tor service. So the Tor service now owns oh, that file. Oh, can write to it. Right. And the last piece is chmod644. This is kind of important. Um, just in general, chmod tells them what can and cannot happen to the file. So if I put chmod 600, mm -hmm. that means only the owner can read or write. Everyone else is locked out. Oh. If I do 666, it means everyone. Everyone <laughs> can read and can everyone write can write. Yeah, it's yeah. basic. Don't do that. It's, <laughs> really, it's, it's a bad idea. Okay. It means everyone has full access. 644 is, is actually a really good one. It's one I use most often. It means that the okay. owner can read and write Everyone else can read, but not write. Okay. So I'm, I'm doing 644. So Tor will be able to read and write to the log, but anybody else, including me, mm -hmm. will be able to just read the log. I don't, want to, I don't want to modify it. I just want to see what's in there. Right. Okay. Now let's go ahead and start the service. Remember I, I promised you I'd show you how to manually start a service? Here we go. Sudo service Tor start. It's that simple. It's that simple. Well, maybe it's that simple. Let's, <laughs> let's make sure that it's actually running. sudo service tor status. There we go. I want that in green. See where it says active running? So the service is running. If it was broken, if I didn't do it right, it would uh -huh. be in red. Okay. But because it's in green, it means I'm happy. Tor is now running. Nice. All okay. right. We're not done yet, though. We gotta check it, though. Well, we we also need to make sure that it actually boots up. Oh, okay. So right now it's running, but if I were to shut down, the service would be there. It just would not start by default. I want to start it by default. So on boot up, got on it. On boot up. So if you go back to my uh, my terminal window, I'm gonna put sudo update dash rc dot d tor enable. Okay. So I've just set it so that every time the Raspberry Pi boots, the Tor service will start up and the AP service will start up. Okay, okay. very nice. Now what we need to do is, as this is so often the case, we're going <laughs> to reboot our, our wonderful uh, little device here. <laughs> Shut down and reboot. Okay, while this is rebooting, let me explain what we've just done. Okay. We've allowed all of, all of our traffic to go from the wireless interface to the Ethernet interface, but it's going to be encapsulated in, in Tor. Right. Okay. This is good because it can anonymi anonymize my location. However, you have to be responsible on how you use it. If you're using, say, Chrome mm -hmm. in your regular mode, all of your cookies are still going to be transmitted through the Tor system. Okay, so if there's a ser web server on the other side that's examining cookies, they can still find out exactly who you are just by looking at the, the little fingerprints that you've left. Okay. okay so if you're going to use Tor, I typically use a perfectly clean browser. I won't even use a browser in incognito mode. I actually have a little USB pen drive uh -huh. that has a, a, a browser on it. Oh, and it, okay. it's, it's perfectly clear every time I, I start it up. Uh -huh. um, but just know that you've anonymized and encrypted the traffic. Right, but but if the, the traffic is still identifying you, then <laughs> you're, you've kind of undone the protection. Okay. All right. That All makes right. sense. So uh, we've, got a, we've freshly booted. If we've done this right, this should be connected. Let, let's uh, see our phone. Is our phone still connected? Yeah, our phone is connected to know-how. So if I go back to a web page here, uh, let's, uh, let's go to a different page, uh, Twit. Let's go to Twit TV. 
There we go. And you'll notice it is a little bit slow. Right, so some of the limitations I assume still with Tor is that the traffic can be slow and there's certain websites that won't allow you to Precisely. access. Uh, like for example, the Twit TV chat room. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. And again, because I'm adding a layer of complexity, of course it's gonna slow it down, but now it's much more secure. Mm -hmm. The question is, is it secure? Let's go back, because remember, we're still tapped We're here. tapped, yeah. So let me stop this. Which is our kind of faux example of what the ISP would be able to see. Correct. So I'm gonna go ahead and go back into this. It's still filtering for DNS. And let's see what happens. Uh, so, Alex, if you come back to the overhead shot, uh, let's let's go to here. So we've we've started the request. It's going out to the web server. It's going to start loading up. Okay. Now switch back to the Wireshark screen. Boom. Nothing. Wait. Is it supposed to be nothing? Yeah, no, it, well, it is, because it means that uh, the DNS has been encrypted. It's, it can't read DNS. Boy, it, if I remove the filter, yeah. hold on. So you'll still see the traffic. I'm getting traffic. Going, but you don't know. Yeah, because, I mean, look at it. It's, it's all it's encrypted. Query. Everything yeah. is encrypted. That's cool. Okay, so it's not getting, it, even though all of this traffic is going through the tab, the tap is not recognizing the regular protocols like it could before it was going through the uh, through the tour. Right. It's just it just shows you it, it actually works. Yeah, no, it's so a good they, way to double check because sometimes it just feels like a magic box. Yeah, it's like oh, know. it's going slower. It must be encrypted. Must not be necessarily. Yeah. A tap's a really good way to check. So cool. I I actually have one of these on the link going out to the internet. So behind my router, or actually in front of my router, over to the cable modem. Yeah. So I can check to see exactly what's coming into and out of my network. It's the very first point of entry. Mm -hmm. In this particular case, I can use this to make sure that nothing is being transmitted in the clear. So I can scrub through all of my packets, and there are some bits of information. Like, actually, go down to the bottom here, Alex. Let me, let, let me show you what I was mm -hmm. talking about before. This is recognizing that it's Google Chrome. So obviously, my browser is not set for incognito mode, right? Right. If, if I want total, total obscurity, total, total security, yeah. I would use a browser that allows me to like turn off everything, hmm. like identify itself wrongly. Like it, it, it will be Chrome identifying itself as Safari, and right. it will turn off all my cookies, so there are no <laughs> cookies being exchanged. Yeah. Uh, again, security is more than just one cool device. Security is gonna require you to do a little bit of critical thinking of what kind of traffic you're actually putting out there. That's really interesting, and I guess, yeah, it, this would all kind of be for not if you were just to use your regular Chrome browser with all your yeah. cookies and save yeah. stuff. Okay. Because on the other end, once you, remember all the Tor network is it anonymizes where you drop into the internet. Yeah. Okay. So when you drop into the regular internet, the non-encrypted internet, it's in a different spot. So mm -hmm. if someone's trying to just locate you via the node that you normally go out of, they won't find you there. Or if they're trying to capture the traffic that's coming out of your network, it's going to be encrypted. They won't be able to figure it out. Yeah. However, if your browser is saying, oh, it's me, it's Father Robert, <laughs> it doesn't matter what I did to anonymize the location. Right. I'm still identifying myself at the far end. I just, I'm imagining it's like um, you put on a disguise or something <laughs> like that. Like you're going out in public with a disguise, but it says, hello, my name is Father Robert Balliser as yeah. like a name tag. Like <laughs> Doing it that way is basically being an archer and saying, yeah. I'm a spy, by the way. Yeah, it's exactly. Like, oh, I don't know okay. if you've heard of me. Bond, <laughs> James Bond. All right. Now... This is not the end of this project. Again, as we mentioned, we kind of stepped this up because we wanted this, you know, it's a good time to, to yeah. get in the, into the public conscious about encryption and security. Mm -hmm. What I want to do with this is I want to be adding this. So this is a little touch wow. screen that I got uh, that it's, it plugs into the Raspberry Pi. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I've got a little coding. It's only 320 by 240, so it's really, really minimal resolution. Still has the plastic on it, Still, though. Philippine that will dog. never come off. Look, see, look, look. See, this is old. Old. Oh, new. my goodness. It's like old. brand new underneath new. that plastic. Right? Right? No, oh, oh, at least until I install it. I don't want to get right, scrapped right. up. <laughs> uh, because right now, I'm limited to this being an, a wireless access point. So it yeah. goes from my device over the wireless into the, into the Raspberry mm -hmm. over Ethernet out. Right. So I can only, there's only one way for me to do this. It's very simple to change it. I just use the interface function on this. And the interface allows me to switch which connection is part of which connection. Okay. Right. So what I want to do is I'm actually in the middle of designing a custom distro mm -hmm. that just does P Raspberry Pi Tor. Wow. Uh, so it, we do none of the steps that we just talked about. You, you just, just plug it in. You image it image, and you yeah. plug it in. But then what it will do is if you have this screen, it will allow you to, I'm going to put two wireless adapters and two Ethernet adapters, one over USB, mm -hmm. and it will say from where to where. Oh, 
So I can go from wireless to wireless, mm -hmm. from wired to wireless, wired to wired, or mm -hmm. wireless to wired. And that will, that will mean that I can use this device anywhere. I can right, go and take it with you. Precisely. And then bring a battery for it or something. Well, it, portable? The, well the or thing plug. I'm building has a battery. Oh. It has oh. like a 12-hour battery on it. So. <laughs> That's, which is why I'm not using the 8-inch. I love uh -huh. the 8-inch touchscreen, but that thing sucks down power. This oh, is yeah. nice and frugal with its power use. Right. And size-wise, you won't have to lug around a precisely, bunch of stuff. Yeah. Precisely. But once I have that done, what it means is you'll have a little teeny tiny package that um, you just sit down. You plug it into your laptop. I would always use wired. I don't use wireless if I want security because mm -hmm. wireless is by its nature insecure. Yes. But I would go from, say, I could go into a Starbucks, plug this into my Ethernet jack, and then tell this, the Raspberry Pi, to connect to the, uh, the Starbucks open Starbucks, Wi-Fi. Yeah. But now I'm going tour from my laptop through the Starbucks system, so anyone looking at my traffic will get it. It's not going to matter. Yeah. Very cool. Right? So that... Hopefully we'll get in May because we've got a couple of projects <laughs> stacked up between now and then. No, that's exciting. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Oh, does this make sense? I mean, there's a reason yeah. why we use the Raspberry Pi 3. Of course, it's it's going to cost you about 40 bucks. But once you got that and the SD card, which will cost you like five bucks, right. once you have that, you're done. There's nothing else you need for this project. This is about a $40, $45 project. Mm -hmm. And now you have something that is a turnkey solution. You plug it in and it is Tor. Yeah. And I the way that I have this script set up, uh, if you follow all the instructions, is if Tor doesn't work, so if Tor disengages, mm -hmm. it kills the connection. Oh, Go instead of starting your um, broadcasting what you're doing on the internet precisely like, unencrypted? There are some other ways to do this. There are some, some uh, auto scripts, which I like, that make them very easy, but it's set up so that if Tor breaks, it still keeps the access point going. So you going. think you're yeah, protected that's, and you're not. That's no bueno. Oh, okay, do okay. And so we did this project, or you did this project on the Raspberry Pi, and this the Pi is powerful enough for the Tor network and everything that you did for this project, but could you use like a different piece of hardware for this sort of thing? You could. Uh, you could probably go with like BeagleBone. A BeagleBone mm -hmm. Black would work really well for this. You could not do this with our, an Arduino, not even a no. Mega. It's just this too much. What about like an old PC or something like that? Uh, yeah. Yes, but this would do it better. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there are limitations, though. As you mentioned, I mean, I'm not, I am slowing down already just because I'm adding an extra layer of complexity to my network stack. However, it's not just that. It, I'm also not going to get anywhere near a gigabit Ethernet. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's just not enough power in the Raspberry Pi to push that many packets while at the same time doing the encryption. So you're not going to try and do gaming while you're on the no. Tor network? No, right? <laughs> Not yeah. unless you like getting fragged. If you like getting fragged yeah. a lot, go ahead and use Tor. <laughs> All <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. Uh, and I think, I think yeah, actually, I'm very glad you brought that up because you should start getting used to the fact that, like, I would never run Netflix through Tor. Uh, that's just... It might work, but on the civic side of me, I don't want to be the jerk that's mucking up the Tor network because I'm sucking down so much bandwidth. Right. That would be a bad thing. Well, so I guess just you have to be responsible. You have to think of what what are the things that you are doing that you necessarily wouldn't want people doing or your ISP, node. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm using someone else's node. Someone else, actually, I'm using several other people's connectivity mm -hmm. and nodes. So I shouldn't be that person who's. You, using up way more than my fair share. Right, right. And I mean, as far as like, if you're gaming or you're doing Netflix, that's not a big deal. But if I'm, I'm doing like Google searches and I'm yeah. planning on going on a trip or something like that, I don't want, you know, advertisers to be jacking up their prices on certain hotels that I was looking at or plane tickets or sending me, like I just bought like a micro SD card and now I'm getting all these uh, Amazon advertisements for buying SD cards. Or like when I'm looking up instructions on making rice and to possibly disable a host. <laughs> um, I don't feel oh, so good. Hmm. That's weird. Uh, I'm going to have to call Comcast and start getting you tracked. Make sure you tour it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, folks, we know that this was a lot of information, but we don't need you to memorize it off the stream. No, the no complete, yes, we do. <laughs> uh, yes, no, no, we don't. <laughs> the complete instructions, and really step by step by step, exactly as we described them, are going to be available on our show notes, along with the blob that you can copy to a USB drive yeah. so that you don't actually have to type in any of the instructions I just gave you. Brian, where did they find that? <laughs> they can go to twit.tv slash kh, and uh, like Padre said, he'll find the episode, and this is going to be a multi-part one, so you'll want to subscribe so you don't miss one. And um, if you want to be a know-how pro, you'll oh, yeah. download it, 
And instead of looking at the show notes, you'll just copy it from the show, which is probably absolutely impossible. So don't do that. So wait, you're telling them to, to like freeze frame? Freeze frame. Pause, type in the command, and then hit play again. You are an evil man. That would Brian be Burnett. terrible. <laughs> that would be the worst. Also, don't forget that you can find us on the socials. you got to go to Google+. Plus. Just uh, look for know-how. There's a very short approval process, but once you're in, you get access to almost 11,000 kitas. That's our know-it-alls. Now, these are people who can help you find projects, who can help you fix a project that you're stuck on, or maybe you just want to share the stuff that you've created. Again, go to Google Plus and look for know-how. That's right, but if you want to know what we're doing outside of know-how or see what uh, kind of upcoming projects yeah. we have going on, you want to follow us on Twitter. I'm at Cranky underscore Hippo. And you're going to find me at Padre SJ. And you're going to find the third member of our team. He is the man who pushes our buttons. That's right. Um, he we, lives uh, in the we, abyss. He's, he's been part of the, the Twit team for longer than most of us. I mean, he, we, he's beloved. That's why he's so easy to forget. I know. He's been I know. around so but, long. Uh, but we lovingly refer to him as Jimbo. <laughs> Jimbo Baggins. Jimbo. Yeah. Jimbo, yep. and uh, you can find Jimbo at twitter.com slash A N E L F 3. Mm -hmm. Follow Jimbo. He's a Excuse good man. Excuse me, Padre, that's pronounced Alex. And this oh. episode went great today, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, it was I, flawless. I, I, and yes. clearly, if there were any edit points, the editor, <coughs> probably Brian, cut me, them out. would never, never leave them in. It was directed so well, though. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see how well it's edited. Until next time, I am Father Robert Palliser. And I'm Brian Burnett. And now that you know how, go torrent. Torrent it. No, just tour. You know what this, the title should be? This episode is tore up. Oh!